we had a little bit of a, of a, of a snafu. We were trying to get the room um, set up. We have decamped to the next room over. And so I think for all of you Zoomers, that was fairly seamless, but uh, the rumors we had to migrate. So um, I'm Bonnie Ripley. I am doing the College Knowledge, knowledge in Progress. Audio off in the room. <laughs> Um, and we have a, a handful of folks in the room here, and uh, we're getting off to a little bit of a late start, so I'm going to jump right in. And I have a, a cast of many who are going to... Sorry. Yeah, muted. Well, let me share the screen so that the Zoomers can see. And I'm going to join on you. Yeah. Where is enable transcript? Or does somebody just request it? Oh, the closed caption? Yeah. Should be at the bottom of your menu, maybe. All right, if anybody needs closed captioning, please request it. All right, so again, I apologize for the delay. We have a lot to cover. So I'm just going to jump right in. And um, I have many co-hosts today. I organize the presentation, um, but experts in their area are going to be telling you about the things that they do. So um, I'm going to have everybody introduce themselves to see what their role is when they, when they stand up or jump in to go over their um, slide. And I want to thank everybody who has helped me out in putting together this presentation. I learned a ton. It was fascinating. And I hope the rest of you um, also enjoy learning about what all of these people around our college do in order to help our students um, be successful. So we're continuing this um, series of College Knowledge Forums. And the goal is for everyone to understand what makes up the student-centered funding formula. There's different parts to the student-centered funding formula. Today, we're uh, on the last part. We already talked about the first two parts. This one's called success. So at the end of this presentation, everybody should be able to say, what is the success portion? Um, um, how are we doing as a college on these metrics? And um, how do these success metrics relate to our college goals? Because we're getting paid by the state for doing well on these things, but do we care about them ourselves anyway? So we want to make sure to make that connection. And then the majority of the time, we're actually going to be listening to the folks who have the you know, the um, most contribution to these specific areas. And so they're really doing the work every day of getting our students to achieve these metrics. Um, and that's what I wanna reserve the most time in the presentation for. And then from all of our roles around the college, what is it that we can do to help our colleagues in order to get the students to those success metrics? All right, a quick review of the overall student-centered funding formula. It's made up of uh, four parts, the, or three parts, depending on how you count it. Most of it is just for FTES, right? So just based on how many students we have, and so 70%, part of that is this thing called the base, and we get a set amount for being a college of less than 10,000 10, FTES or more than 10,000. And then we get an allocation per 
um, FTES. The last two parts of the student success, uh, student centered funding formula are actually the student centered parts. Um, we talked about the supplemental 20% in the last College Knowledge Forum. And that one, we get additional um, money from the state depending on how many students we have on different kinds of financial aid. So it's a, it sort of pays us more if we have poorer students um, that, uh, so to help us serve these students, which might take a little extra love, um, and also to incentivize us to help get the most students we can on financial aid because that improves student success and persistence. So financial aid is super duper important. Um, we're gonna talk today about what makes up the remaining 10% and that is called the success portion. Um, and so we'll talk in more detail about what is part of this success funding. Um, the data that you're going to see in this presentation come from two different dashboards. One of them is the CalPASS Plus launch board student success metrics, and the other one is the SCFF dashboard, the SCIF dashboard. Um, and uh, I don't know if you can link to those, those links from the slideshow, but we'll provide you with those links um, at, somehow in, at some point. So this slide shows from growth for the district from 2021-22, how much money we got from the state. Um, it shows the supplemental in the orange, but we're gonna focus on the blue today. And it totals about $9 million, which is not trivial. And it is made up of a handful of metrics. The number of associate degrees for transfer awarded, the number of associate degrees, those are our local degrees, the number of credit certificates, we don't offer any baccalaureate degrees, the number of students that succeed in transfer level math and or English in the first year, the number of transfers, and then two CTE metrics, nine or more CTE units, and regional living wage, right? So we get a certain amount for each student that is um, uh, achieves these success metrics. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about these metrics, quickly show you some data on them. It's not very exciting, so I wanna keep this really quick and get to the place where we're gonna talk more about what do we as a college have to do in order to get students through these metrics. All right, and we're gonna go in the order that a student would experience these different metrics. So we're gonna start with um, completing transfer level math and English. Um, then we're going to do the degrees and certificates. Then we're going to do the um, uh, CTE metrics. All right. So completing transfer level math and English, the universe of it was changed dramatically. Um, in 2017, there was a state um, assembly bill uh, AB 705, if you've heard about this bill before, um, then what it did was it said that multiple measures needed to be used for placement into English and math courses. We couldn't just use an assessment test and that students could only be placed into remedial classes if, college, if the college can demonstrate that they're highly unlikely to pass the transfer level courses without taking that remedial course. Um, Alan, are you gonna jump up and do the next slide or do you want me to do it? I'm happy to, yeah. Okay, get ready to jump up. Okay. <laughs> um, so <laughs> um, the reason, uh, and what is transfer level math? Um, transfer level math is a, a math 120 or higher. And then transfer level English, that's only English 120. So it's a little simpler on the English side. Now we wanna go back in history a little bit and make sure everybody understands why it was important that this um, sort of series of remedial courses, we, that we shifted away from, um, from that paradigm. And the reason for that was that when students started in those lower levels of courses, they ended up um, 
many more of them ended up um, uh, dropping out or not completing, not completing, <laughs> not completing their degree. And that especially affected marginalized groups and uh, especially the assessment test, right? And uh, Alan Trailer from the English department is gonna share with us um, a real world example of what this looked like in the English department. Hi, uh, thanks, Bonnie. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm Alan Trailer. I'm the incoming English department co-chair for Fall 23. Uh, this is uh, data we collected uh, in-house at Grossmont College uh, between 2015 and 2017. For sort of the, this is the uh, data pertinent to us, but uh, this is replicated statewide over and over. This was something that we found out uh, with our involvement with the uh, uh, California Acceleration Project, uh, which was an initiative by uh, Professor Katie Hearn. I forget what school she's from, uh, but uh, uh, they, she sort of created this uh, initiative to address some of these shortfalls because what we discovered was, what they discovered was, and what we also discovered with our own data was that the further below transfer level uh, students uh, uh, were, were placed according to assessment, the less likely it was that they were actually going to succeed in a transfer level course. Uh, so for example, and I'll just kind of point out the two most pertinent stats here, but uh, you can see the disparity between three levels or three or more levels below transfer. If a student was placed three or more levels below transfer, this was a course we used to have called English 90, only 16% of those students made it to English 120 and succeeded. Uh, conversely, if a student was placed in English 120, 79% uh, of those students uh, passed and moved on. Uh, so there was, a, there was a huge disparity here uh, between the, uh, the levels below. And this came, became a matter of equity. Uh, and so the, the CAP project uh, kind of came into being as a way to sort of address this. And then this was sort of superseded by AB 705, which mandated uh, uh, the sort of uh, removal of these uh, remedial classes unless colleges to prove that they were necessary. Uh, so uh, originally what we were doing was we had a big five unit, one level below course called English 99 uh, that was sort of meant to uh, uh, prep students for the transfer level course, because as you can see, one level below students are much more likely than three levels below to, to transfer and to sort of prepare them for that. And then AB 705 superseded that. Uh, and so now, and you'll see you'll see this a little bit later in terms of what we're doing now. But we've we've uh, put we've we've done a lot of things over the last several years to address uh, uh, the the reality now, which is our students, whether they uh, you know are assessed uh, coming in via multiple measures uh, uh, with it uh, you know ready for English 120 or not quite ready for English 120. Uh, uh, they're all placing into English 120, and so we've done things like create a co-rank course and, and uh, um, added a lab to the lecture component and so on. So there's a lot that uh, we've done to address that. Cindy says she was at, was at Chabot. Chabot, yeah. Uh, is it Chabot? Skyline now. Yes. Thank you, Cindy. Awesome. Okay, thank you. The, um, so the... The urgency or the reason that the um, these courses were um, the curriculum had was changed so much in our English and our in our math department. So I quickly want to show you some data of, of what happened since AB705 was implemented. And we've got English completion rates uh, first, and then we'll do math. We'll come back later in the presentation for those departments to talk a little bit more about what it has taken for them to convert their whole curriculum and try and get students to be successful in the um, going straight into those uh, college transfer level courses. All right, so all of these graphs are gonna have across the X axis academic years, and they go back to um, you know 2011, 12, but we wanna sort of focus on the the right hand side of the data, the big arrow is showing 2017, 2018. And colleges were starting to maybe decrease some of their um, lower level courses before that, but that's when it, it really it really started. And so what we can see pretty clearly on the English transfer level com completion rates is that um, yes, we sort of see this <laughs> a change in slope of the line, right? So a lot more students are being successful if they're going straight into those classes. 
Um, and the other thing about this slide is I picked the one that has um, disaggregated by ethnicity. And what we also want to look for is um, how big the equity gap is and what's happening to it. So if we go way back to 2011, 2012 over here, this difference between the green line and the orange line is our equity gap between white and Hispanic students. So if we look at how well they're succeeding in our courses, um, that's one of our goals as a college is to eliminate these gaps that any student coming into our course despite whatever their, their ethnicity is, that they have an equal probability of um, completing. And if we look at what happened after AB 705, um, not only are all success rates going up, um, we had this little dip here, <laughs> um, and uh, that uh, is uh, uh, COVID related, right? So remember that uh, the spring of 2020 is when we suddenly went online for the COVID pandemic. All right, so, but um, uh, African-American and Hispanic students haven't had a dip. They have um, continued to have the same level of success in English. All right, so not only have those rates gone up, but if we look, especially most recently, the gap, that white space between the, the um, uh, white students and, and African-American students, the gap has decreased. So from that perspective, that is what this legislation was intended to promote, and it is so far being successful with that, which is really exciting. If we look at math completion rates, so same figure just for math, again, starting over the same time frame and going up through um, 2021, also disaggregated. This is again the year when AB705 was fully implemented. So overall, the success rates are a little lower because math is, you know, um, people are afraid of it and they don't like turn their brains on <laughs> through math. So that uh, is a, a bit of a, of a struggle for many students. But again, when we look at what happened after 2017, we see increases in success rates, completion rates in the transfer level courses. And we also see a narrowing of the achievement gaps, right? So um, that white space between the green and the orange line, it's wiggled around a little bit, um, but in generally it's gotten um, uh, smaller, right? So, um, Amazing, excellent, superb work on behalf of the math and English departments. As they will tell you later, this was not a simple and easy thing to do. And they're still working really hard on trying to make it work for students, make it work for themselves and continue these increases. So if we think about this in terms of our funding and our student success formula, if we have slight increases continuing across these metrics, then that means more funding for the college, right? Also, students completing their transfer level math and English, which means they're on the pathway to completing their um, degree and meeting their educational goals. All right, shifting gears to um, degrees and certificates and uh, trans transfers. Um, again, this is a quick review of what those metrics look like and what we're doing with them. Degrees and certificates, if we look across um, the history of time across the bottom of the slide and um, going again, so here's where COVID hit, 2019, 2020. We've had a little, a little COVID decline um, in our uh, completion of degrees. Um, and across this time period, what we have had is a big increase in these associate degrees for transfer as more and more departments have brought them online over this time period. So uh, the trend for degrees and certificates, again, is gradual slight increases over time with some little negative effect of the pandemic. And again, everyone that we award uh, gives us more funding, so that's good. Transfers, we have had a pretty good record of transfers, especially to the CSU and UC. This slide separates it out between 
those which are our main transfer uh, goals or destinations versus the private and out of state schools. And we've had, again, uh, small increases and continuous increases in the CSU UC transfers. And so that is um, positive for us to, if we want to keep increasing on these metrics, not only are students achieving their educational goal, but they are um, helping us get more funding. So our two um, career tech ed workforce development metrics that are included in the student success formula are nine or more CT units um, attained. And again, if we look historically from 2014 to 2020, we've had a small but steady increase in percent of students making that um, successful att attainment. In many programs, nine or more CTE units is three courses, which gets them a certificate or some level of um, increase in their skills or knowledge that allows them to get a promotion or to start a job that has a higher paying wage. So that's the reason the nine or more units was selected. And what that tells us is that um, we're continuing to do a little better at getting students through um, a series of, of courses. Regional living wage is another thing that we're um, that's counted as part of the success metrics. Um, you can argue about whether $38,000 is a living wage in San Diego. <laughs> um, it is intended for um, a single adult, um, and it is measured using, using data from the Employment Development Department. So it only counts folks who are in jobs that have unemployment insurance um, because the, the wage that they're earning is tracked with their social security number, which is tied to their educational history. <laughs> right, so we have to be able to link together a student who exited Grossmont College, didn't transfer, right? went into a job um, that makes at least this much money in the year following their academic year of exit. So this is a pretty specific metric. And it's basically, did a student finish community college um, and go into a job in their um, you know, field that they trained in, which is, which is another metric. Again, we have had a small uh, increase across time in these, in these metrics, um, and so that's good as well. So generally, to sum up across all of our metrics, we have had um, a fairly big increase in success rates for our English and math transfer, and we've had steady small increases in these other metrics. All right, um, we're going to move into the portion of the workshop today where we're talking about do these success metrics that we're getting paid for by the state, do they matter to us at Rosemont? And if I have Joan Ahrens in the house, she was going to talk about this slide. So go ahead, Joan. Thank you, Bonnie. And I'm not going to belabor the point by spending too much time on this. Other than to say that in the past, um, when the state came down with um, initiative after initiative, each of those initiatives had their own set of metrics. And it was um, maddening um, because, you know, we, then we had our own um, institutional metrics and it was just really difficult to um, monitor them all. And so with the vision for success, we decided to um, align our metrics um, because all of the initiatives coming um, with the vision for success, uh, they, they were, I should say, all of the initiatives that were under the umbrella for the vision for success, all of the metrics were aligned as well. So it made it easier for us to align everything um, as the state did as well. So you'll see that um, the momentum, milestones, student goals, these are the student, these refer to the student's journey. And um, they also refer to the guided pathways framework. 
And so um, you'll see that our metric um, completion of transfer, transfer level English and math within the first year is one of the metrics that Bonnie mentioned earlier. And it is under our equity goals, our mission um, statement. It's covered in our strategic plan. It also is covered under um, the vision for success goals, which is now, by the way, roadmap to success. And our equity plan goals is covered by AB705, by the student-centered um, funding formula, and also our strategic enrollment management um, goals. And then um, you'll see units attained. You'll see the various initiatives. Um, it's covered under our mission, strategic plan, equity plan, um, strong workforce um, uh, plan, and student enrollment, uh, I'm sorry, strategic enrollment management plan. Too much copy this morning. Mm -hmm. um, with degree, certificate, and completion, that covers everything. And our strategic uh, plan, we have completion, creating a com completion environment is one of our um, goals. You'll also see transfer, job placement rate, and attainment of living regional living wage and where they um, fall under um, which uh, college initiative or plan. So again, all I all this really shows is that all of the various metrics that Bonnie that Bonnie has been describing are um, KPIs are aligned with those metrics. Thank you. Thank you, Joan. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, the other way of thinking about, and there was a question in the chat, what do SWP and SEM stand for? And the answer is strong workforce partnership and SEM is strategic enrollment management. So we aren't gonna talk about strategic enrollment management specifically in this presentation, um, but, all of these metrics that we're talking about, if we're doing a good job on them, then enrollments should go up as well. All right. Okay. So when we're thinking about how do these metrics align with other things we're doing at the college, another really important contributor to kind of work that we're already doing and spending a lot of time and effort on is the student success framework, or basically what we what we call our guided pathways. Project. So I have some guided pathways folks who are standing by to tell us about, um, give us a reminder of what guided pathways is all about and how it aligns with kind of the way these metrics um, metrics play out. Who's going to start on that? Gary. Hi, Bonnie. This is Hi, Bonnie. This is Cindy. I think I'm going to start and then I'm going to turn it over to Gary to um, okay. finish up. Thank you. Uh, no problem. Um, hi, everybody. It's really good to kind of virtually see you all today. Uh, I uh, hope that some of you remember this graphic that we have been using over the last couple of years to illustrate the student success framework and how guided pathways is a part of the um, uh, is a part of the um, overall plan and I hope one of the things that struck me as I was listening to Bonnie open up is how those first three or four items that are part of the student success funding formula are things that the guided pathways team have been working on to uh, projects to ensure that the path is clarified for students from the moment they first consider Grossmont College as an option to when they enter the path and uh, the supports that and the projects that we have been involved in or are working on that helps students as they are making decisions about what their path is and how to efficiently move through the path, stay on the path and ensure learning. And so Gary's gonna talk a little bit more about um, some of the things that we've been doing and um, go on to the next slide. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, Gary Johnson, the chair in counseling. Um, I, I might be a little biased in this state, but I'm thinking that Guided Pathways is starting to take a little more shape. Um, the website was getting some feedback from the students. I think it's getting more use. I'm definitely including that in my routine with students to have them view the website, utilize that. 
So that way they get a clear understanding of what would be on the path if they choose to change it or just even initially before they start that path. Uh, but I also want to acknowledge in this whole effort that a lot of the staff support our students in even when we talk about, you know, enter the path, the student ambassadors and the lobbies here do a tremendous job of helping them enroll in courses. Um, my role as I see it, as I continue to do these degree plans, is to have that clarity of the map. Again, I'm sorry about that. We're going to change that to degree plans instead of maps. But uh, also, you know, it does provide them with a structure that says, if you take the courses in this pattern, you will be in completion. So I like the idea that we're talking about completion culture, and we know it's a big part of the funding formula, 10%. But also, it's another reminder that we all can speak the the same language to the student. Once we get this fully developed, and we talk about completion of the financial aid application that helps them, you know, FTS should go up just by the welcoming environment and what happens here on our campus that's unique to other campuses. So all that to say that I'm very encouraged by this project. I'm hoping to see even more tangible results. Because another thing I speak to with the pathways is making this college going process go from the abstract component to a more tangible and concrete uh, visual for the student. So they can really see themselves and completing and tie that more to careers. Because it's not just talking about here's your academic plan, then what do you do? They can already start connecting themselves to a career path and seeing what that living wage might look like for them. And that's what I have on my slide. So thank you. All right, thanks, Gary. And if you guys have one more slide. So I guess just briefly to summarize, um, if I could, and maybe um, is that basically, as you've all heard in number a number of forums, is there's two primary projects that um, there are many projects that we're involved in the guided pathways team, but the two primary ones are um, the academic and career pathway website as Gary talked about uh, and Courtney put some things in the chat about improving navigation for mobile devices, making it easier to find fast track certificates and programs that can be completed uh, in less than two years, um, guidance for undecided and ESL students, degree plans for more certificates at AA programs. We're not 100% there, but we're really close. And the other part um, under the four pillars, we have Griffin Inquiry and Action Teams, our GOTS that include counseling, instructional faculty, and classified, um, <laughs> I'm laughing at Alan, uh, classified staff working together. And that is um, fabulous to see and listen to the things that they're coming up with. Uh, and they're using and examining data and developing their own projects and programs so that students stay on the path and work to ensure learning. And so that's kind of what we've been up to. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, and my, my own personal experience getting introduced to the Guided Pathways kind of idea actually came before the college started working on it. Um, I saw a presentation over at Cuyamaca and they were talking about these degree maps and I was like, oh my gosh, what a cool thing. Um, and they said, oh, it's this Guided Pathways thing. And so um, I actually picked up this book which is called Redesigning America's Community Colleges, which was published in 2015. And it lays out why Guided Pathways is structured how it is, what the idea is. And it has lots of data and studies that back up that the things that students need in order to be successful um, are maybe different from traditionally what we thought they did. Um, and the things that were in this book and this idea about guided pathways, it completely overlapped with what I had already seen from my students and figured out from talking to my students. So I was like, well, of course this thing makes sense. This is exactly what we need to do. Um, so I, I hope that as you learn more about the guided pathways and sort of what it is, what it is about, it's basically, what are we actually gonna do in order to help students meet their goals? So we're gonna have English and then math immediately after tell us a little bit more about what it takes to get a student to complete transfer level English in our post AB 705 world. Thanks, Bonnie. Uh, so uh, we have done an enormous amount of work over the past several years to try to uh, honor our goals and assist our students. 
uh, including using multiple measures, primarily for placement students with a 2.6 or higher GPA. Uh, we recommend they place in English 120. Students with a 2.5 or lower, we recommend they take the 120 with the uh, support course, with, uh, with the co-requisite course. We've eliminated our pre-transfer level courses, all of them, including all the courses that were once disambiguated by writing and or composition and reading as two separate classes. All of that is gone now. All of our classes are not just composition, they're also reading and critical thinking classes. Uh, we've added a co-requisite support course, like I said, for those uh, students who need the extra support. It's O2O, it's a one unit uh, course. Uh, we have uh, uh, added embedded tutors to those same courses. Uh, uh, and uh, the uh, as tutoring, we have a lot of data that shows that tutoring is directly uh, related to an increase in student success, persistence, retention. Uh, we have uh, linked our courses uh, where we can to Emoja and Fuente and uh, recently, more recently to the athletics uh, uh, department uh, to provide additional support to disproportionately impacted student groups. And uh, we've uh, increased uh, English 120 uh, to include an hour of lab time. So it's a four unit course now, uh, and uh, which would make it a five unit course if you were taking it with the O2O component, it's essentially two extra hours of lab. Uh, and then uh, we have also uh, engaged, and I think uh, uh, Sarah uh, Seliger can speak more to this, uh, but uh, we, we've uh, included a lot of PD related to how to grade more equitably, how to uh, include equitable teaching uh, practices in the classrooms. A lot of this was inspired by CAP. Uh, we've continued the process as we go, uh, or as we've been going. Um, Sarah, Cindy, did anyone want to add anything to any of that, or are we good? Let's say we're good. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Do you get paid the same for your one hour of lab as you do for lecture, or do you not have lecture lab parity like in the sciences? Mm -hmm. No, we don't get. The, it's the yeah, same. Yeah, it's the same. It's the same as the sciences. It's there's no parity yet. It's it's a uh, lab, whatever it is, point five eight oh five eight or whatever that is. Am I right? Oh five eight per hour, something like that. <laughs> Ours is 0.17. Yeah. But that's for a three hour lab. That's for a three hour lab. It, it's the same. Okay. Everybody has the same lab rate. Um, okay. Hi, I'm Jenny Vanden from the math department. Susan working, also math department. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so what have we done to comply with AB705? Well, again, just like English. We've done a lot of work uh, and we continue to do work because there's also 1705, AB 1705, which followed in the footsteps of AB 705. Uh, we definitely changed to multiple measures using high school GPA and last uh, successful class that they passed. Um, we eliminated our pre-transfer level math courses. So no more uh, intermediate algebra and below. Um, and uh, a little bit different from English, we actually have lots of entry points for students because we have students with different paths. And so we have what we call the SLAM path and the BSTEM path. The SLAM path is the statistics and liberal arts mathematics courses, which we have again, support courses linked to our parent courses of quantitative reasoning, which is 120 and elementary statistics, which is 160, um, those students, that would be a terminal class for them. So they're entering in, uh, all students now enter in transfer level math. The SLAM path may or may not be done after that one class. Uh, the BSTEM is business, science, technology, engineering, and math path. Uh, we actually have um, two pathways to calculus essentially um, for the STEM students. Either they can take college algebra and then trigonometry and then their calculus one class, or they can take a one semester course, um, which we call 176 pre-calculus to get to that calculus course. Course 178 is our business calculus and those students can enter directly into business calculus uh, with support or without. Um, so we have, I know it's a lot of numbers and a lot of paths and a lot of, a, a lot of <laughs> classes and, and hopefully you can see 
the level of difficulty has been for us to um, meet students where they are at that first transfer level class and um, propel them through the pathway into their major. Um, we've done similar things as English. We have embedded tutoring in all of our support classes. Uh, we picked up, uh, we started piloted last semester, Mind Over Math, which is uh, where we have a mental health counselor coming into all of our support classes uh, about every other week, about seven times a semester. And um, you might say, what does mental health have to do with taking a math class? Well, you might just have thought that second thought after you thought, what does mental health have to do with taking a math class? And then you thought, oh yeah, I could have used some mental health in my math class. So, um, so since every student is starting in transfer, that is different from what we've done in the past. And so we're trying to, again, meet students where they are and help them through this um, transition just as much as we need help. Through Actually, the mental health counselor has been great for me as a teacher. <laughs> and I wish all of you had a mental health counselor coming in and doing you know, meditations and uh, mindfulness training. So um, it's been great. Yeah, and then um, we're continuing the support as we move into AB 1705. So one of the things we've done beyond just first transfer level course, we realized the students needed help when they got to the calculus sequence as well. Um, and that had to do with not only this, also COVID. So we were trying to help them out. So we have created a support course for calculus one and calculus two. The students are all mixed. We are piloting it this semester. Jenny's, Jenny's actually the instructor. And we even had one teacher who has a student from Cuyamaca in her class. They're in 180 and currently in Jenny's support course. And they called it magical. So <laughs> just so you know, so we're uh, hopefully hoping to call that 180L, 280L in the fall 2023. And then probably most of you have already heard this. We are also doing the math jam. It's a non-credit course. And that is prior. It's basically a boot camp prior to the semester beginning. And that is geared toward just the students who would be enrolling in um, a B-STEM transfer level course. So the 175, 176, 178. Um, and basically that is beyond boot camp. It's a lot of fun. They're gonna learn about resources, get a little, get their foot in the door for how to be a college student. Um, they get to meet uh, a lot of different people. We, we're all humanized a little bit. We're having lunch with them, including the president, counselors, with the mental health counselors coming in, success coaches. And we think that was very successful in the fall. We're just doing that in the fall. Um, and we're going to, hopefully we have their IDs to follow them from fall to this spring as well. That's it, any questions? Great. <laughs> Thank you, Jenny and Susan, and the entire math department. So um, just again, from talking to math and English, my impression is how much work it has been for them to go through this process. So um, thanks to everyone who's been participating in this. Okay, we're gonna switch gears from um, talking about math and English to talking about completion. And under the umbrella of completion, we're going to have includes degrees, transfers, and certificates. And I'm going to turn it over to Dee Aceves and Tanil Renard, who have been standing by ready to go. Um, and just let me know when you need to go to your next slide. Uh, thank you, Bonnie. Um, so my name is Dia Sevis and I'm the College Articulation Officer. And I'm Tennille Venard, Evaluations Advisor. So we're here to talk specifically around the ADTs and we have some um, information to, to share in three different areas. And we're gonna start with articulation. So we wanted to share first what it takes and then what our area impact is for the three areas. And so in terms of articulation, the ADTs uh, building blocks are articulation based. And so we use articulation, course identification, articulation by major, uh, CSU transferability, general education for CSU, baccalaureate level courses for CSU. We use the, those articulation components um, to build the ADTs. 
And so that framework is captured inside what we call a TMC, which is the template model curriculum. The template model curriculum is a um, is forged, I would say, between CSU faculty and community college faculty um, and their discipline review groups. And so in these groups, they decide what the requirements should be um, and meet the um, lower division prep for both levels of education. And so they work together to determine what courses, how many units, what type of requisites the courses should have. Um, and so once they have done that collaborative work, then we uh, are provided with the TMC. And then here at the local level, we work on getting that through curriculum approval, board approval, and chancellor's office approval. So there is a, a, a very serious vetting process that takes place with the ADTs and a lot of work is front loaded to ensure that these will meet the requirements not only for our college, but also the 23 CSUs. So some of the other behind the scenes articulation work that happens with these uh, degrees are substitutions. And we use the modification of major locally as appropriate because again, we have to ensure that the articulation requirements are met. Um, we also use pass along. And then we also consider reciprocity. So reciprocity is a process by which we um, allow for students to bring over their coursework that is usable across the system. And so if a student took a class at another CCC and there is similar articulation through course, course identification, then we wanna help that student use that course. Um, so not preventing students from bringing over their curriculum because the articulation is in place. And so we use the ADT guidelines uh, very often to make determinations in gray-ish in gray areas. Um, and then also as um, articulation officers, we receive knowledge from the chancellor's office, um, as well as from our partners um, at the CSU through SEAC, which is the California Intersegmental Articulation Council. And so that regional representation and communication is very helpful um, with these degrees. I also work closely with the counseling division because they're uh, frontline workers as well in meeting with the students one-on-one -on -one and providing updates for counselors. I monitor or prepare advising sheets for them and then I'm available for consultation should they have a situation with the student they need some assistance with. And so we work really closely together to keep that information current um, and that's really helpful. Um, I also work with instructional operations to ensure the catalog has appropriate updates um, made, to the, uh, made to the degrees um, and that the information for our courses is accurate. Um, one of the recent changes that you might notice is our CID information has made it to the catalog. So that's in our last two catalogs. Um, so just trying to make sure we're, we have more information easily accessible for everyone. And then last but not least, um, I work closely with students, counselors, evaluators, faculty, um, and um, other folks on ADT related situations. So um, these things come up all year round. There is no downtime for this. It's always something coming up. Uh, there are review cycles for everything. And so it's a constant staying on top of the next thing. In terms of area impact, um, I'm happy to say we, we've um, had at least 200 or more approved pass-alongs. There are 27 approved ADTs and one other one coming. We've had most of these for quite some time. And so we're, I think the, we're just getting better at uh, communicating those um, and look forward to seeing that number grow again. Um, we have 362 approved courses via CID. And then just um, I'm constantly monitoring any new courses that need to be added to um, articulation agreements that would help us to um, make sure our TMCs are in good shape and also to apply for CSU GE and I guess the uh, GE as well. So um, that's it for articulation. Next slide. I'm trying. Thank you. And we're going to go ahead and cover the transfer portion. Sarah Moore was not able to be with us today, but we'll go ahead and uh, get started in talking about what it takes for the transfer center. All right. And so what does it take? In the transfer center, uh, key to ensuring that our students have uh, the best information is staying abreast 
um, and interpreting the admissions practices and policies for the 23 CSUs. Each one is individual and unique, and they have their own practices for their institution, which means that we have to stay on top of the information coming out so that our students have the most current and updated information per admission cycle. So this is also ongoing. Um, and if you've noticed at all, the admission cycles are staying open longer. Um, again, a COVID thing probably because the admission numbers are down, but staying on top of those practices is very helpful. The ADTs are a strategy for admission. Um, it's one of the ways that students have access to the system. And so again, it's really important to ensure that we have all of those facts about the student um, to share with them what the best transfer pathway would be and what the local service area priorities are. And so that will be different again by CSU. And so um, in the transfer center, uh, one of Sarah's best practices is to share out information after meeting with CSUs um, and sharing that out with counselors so that they get that information, but also updating information on the, C on the student facing side through Canvas Shell. And so, and their transfer center website. So all of the information is ready and available for students should any of um, any new information become available. Okay, and then also the transfer center will assist students with the application process and including next steps for admitted and denied students. They do a lot of amazing work helping our students, especially when they've been denied. And that's where I'll speak about it a little bit later on the teamwork between the two departments, and then also troubleshooting transfer situations. It's individual for each student, and they just do such amazing work at seeing exactly what the student needs and helping them through. And then we're gonna go ahead and head over to what is your area impact? All right, and so for Transfer Center, we wanted to highlight um, the 1,326 counseling appointments that were held to prepare students for transfer. These are very detailed appointments. There are oftentimes uh, multiple transcripts, multiple institutions and uh, segments that the in students are interested in transferring to. And so just wanted to highlight um, the robust services between uh, a transfer center director, staff and adjunct counseling faculty in this area. And then we have about 756 students attending transfer center workshops, along with over 18,000 student contacts, which include email, phone, drop-in, e-counseling, Zoom info sessions. And I have to say, as an evaluator working with students at the counter, and they have questions about this, I've had Sarah come over and help them at the counter. So they're always there just to help our students no matter what. So it's a great benefit for our students. And I think we're ready for the next one. Okay, so this is for me. And again, I'm Tenille Bernard. I am in an evaluations team of four. That would include Olivia Krause, uh, Karen Wong, and also Sandra Ramos. And we are in the admissions and records office. So what does it take from the evaluations office? We would research, analyze, and evaluate student academic history in compliance with the ADT requirements includes local and transferring students, so for both. We also will process degree requests, including completing the full comprehensive degree evaluation for our students. We will assist with paper verifications, and that's what I was speaking about with the transfer center. Those paper verifications are for our students that perhaps they put in the wrong um, information on their application, and it's going to jeopardize their admission. We can come back after they've met with the transfer center counselors. We will complete the paper verification, and that is sent directly onto the CSU system. So hopefully that will help them streamline and not have any hiccups when they wait for their acceptance. Also, we as evaluators will verify students' ADT completion status on the CSU database. So not only are we doing the evaluations of each individual student, we also need to go into the CSU system electronically and let them know by March 15th um, for the spring semester if the student has applied and if they've met the degree or they've already been awarded the degree. And um, we have to abide by their deadline. Those aren't our deadlines. Also, we communicate with students, counselors, faculty, local CSU admissions departments 
I, I can't say enough how thankful I am with the communication that I have and the help that I have with um, articulation, counseling. Um, you know, it just is so helpful. And in the end, it's all for the student. Also, we award degrees every semester, fall, spring, and summer. We all know there's only one commencement, but there's no downtime. <laughs> and then also we print and distribute all degrees and certificates for Grossmont College. Uh, and when it comes to the what your area impacts, this is just a little bit of information on the verification data for ADTs that we have electronically verified for the past four years. You can see it was a little higher, 1920, 885 students, 2021, 812. We did drop 2122 to 730, and now we're at 706. This is not including paper verification. So there's paper verifications on top of that. Yes, we've had a decline, but we also contribute that to the uh, pandemic. And then in 2019-20, over 250 plus paper verifications were submitted directly to the CSU admissions offices. And again, that's over all 23 CSU um, admissions. Go ahead and head over to our teamwork and what we do to do that. And oh, that's me again. Okay. So for goal one, uh, we want to make sure it's a seamless process for degree achievement and successful transfer to the CSU system. Goal number two is always to do what's best for the student. And so um, with that, again, we work together as a team, um, whether it's forward or backward in this um, pipeline that we have going here. But we want to ensure that the student is making really good choices here at Grossmont that will not cause any disruptions upon transfer and uh, taking a look at all of the possibilities and the outcomes. So we wanna do what's um, you know, following our, our regulations, but also do what's best for them and, and informing them of all of their options. I think we all understand that some of these choices belong in the student's court, but it's our job to be informed and provide them with all of that information so that they can make really good choices. Absolutely. And goal number three, we ensure that our college documents accurately reflect degree requirements for ADTs, along with all degrees and certificates. And Dee does a really good job with that on our uh, advising sheets and the catalog, all of that good stuff. And then we also do that within the degree audit system. And then always our, our goal number four is uh, to communicate, communicate, communicate. Oftentimes we um, can um, pass the baton to one another when we're working with the student and we go back and forth. Um, and that works really well because at the end of that uh, race, the student crosses the line, but it's because we were able to really work well together, whether that was with the modification, a pass along, uh, a CSU GE question, whatever comes up, it's always been um, reciprocity. reciprocity. Yeah. So all of the different things that we kind of tackle, um, we sometimes oh, I already know about that because so-and-so already called, you know, so it's really nice to have that continuity on the back end so that students get quick and fast answers um, when they're looking uh, for, for that admission, yes. Um, yes. And so lots of teamwork um, mm -hmm. on our end. Also, we just wanted to note, and probably a lot of people know about this, but Grossmont has been recognized as the champion of higher education for two consecutive years. And that was the 1819 year and 1920. We were both invited to a ceremony up in LA. Um, so that was really special. And also we've always been like top 10 from here on out through the champion of higher education with awarding degrees in ADTs. And this little fun fact you might've already heard, um, it's, it's probably um, one of our uh, proudest uh, but we are consistently the top local transfer institution to San Diego State. And so consistently meaning we're mostly first, <laughs> but here and there, there is one year, one or two years at Mesa College, I think beat us out. But we are um, doing a really good job in terms of communicating the information to students when it comes to our CSU uh, feeder of SDSU. So very proud of that. Um, but that is really a compliment to the college, um, you know, because that takes all of us, that takes the faculty, the staff, um, administrators, it takes all of us to do this good work. Um, so that was our presentation on ADT information and how that contributes to the student success funding formula. Um, and
we really thank you for everyone's support with what we do on on within the ADTs in all degrees. So we appreciate it. Thank you, Gary. Thank you so much, Dean and Neil. Um, I'm exhausted just listening to all of the different things that you have to do and how many students you serve. Um, it makes a huge difference. I know I've helped students out sometimes with, you know, trying to get like one weird little thing fixed and there has to be a person that can actually help them with that one-on-one. -on -one. So thank you for all that you do. We're gonna wrap up with um, a few minutes of um, Dean Javier Ayala is gonna tell us about what it takes to get CTE workforce development students um, to complete their metrics and what they're doing. Great. I think I have your other Hi, everyone. Um, just in case you don't know, the Zoom room is really cold. <laughs> just kidding. This room is cold. So we're in the darkness. So hopefully you can see me. Um, I, I want to go back a couple slides. I think it was slide number four, where Bonnie shared the impact of the CT metrics. So there was two metrics that she shared. One was about the nine units or more in CTE, right? And it showed a big number, a million dollars that's brought into it. And then there was the, the regional living wage attainment, which is another million dollars. So when it comes to the CTU metrics, that's cash flow that comes to the college. Um, and it is much more than cash because it helps our students achieve their goals, right? In career education, CTE. Um, but the other thing I wanna share really quickly is um, there's a completion measure that's non-credit. And I'll talk a little bit about that. I know I have a few minutes, so. I quickly want to highlight um, some of the programs that uh, tie directly to the nine units or more. So some of the programs of the last couple of years, um, as you can see on, on this slide, AOJ forensics, um, there's been smaller chunk curriculum as opposed to doing the full two years, which means that students who do nine or more units um, get counted in terms of the student center funding formula, the SCIF is what's called. Uh, and then we also redeveloped, we hired some new faculty. Jojo's one of them. If you haven't met Jojo, she's newly tenured, uh, but she brings executive background um, in the workforce and help develop more of the executive chef program. Um, we're looking at apprenticeships. We've got uh, Professor Robin Spulwood on the back, uh, looking to develop those programs because they, again, they get the whole point of CTE is to get folks into a career track so they can go directly to work after a semester, one year, um, and also complete a two-year degree in transfer. So one of our biggest transfer majors is business, and that's also CT. Um, we've developed shorter-term programs, like in, in uh, computer science information uh, systems, cybersecurity. So you can do an IT certificate, a cybersecurity certificate. And then with CTE, it's not even though my division that I work with is career technical education and workforce development, when it comes to the way the state looks at CTE units completed and CTE um, uh, certificates, it's much broader than that. So that you could have a um, CTE program that's in a different division. So for example, we have a data, data science certificate that includes courses from physics, includes programming courses from CSIS, et cetera, et cetera, and that is a CTE certificate. So we get um, uh, apportionment for that as well. And then other, uh, uh, most recently, we have a supply chain certificate um, that also counts for those nine units or more. The other part that's really exciting that we went from zero to 100% is that last item here. So when you look at the metrics, there's enrollment, there's student success, there's the, the last 10%, whatever number that we're talking about. Um, we, this year, went into a whole different area called career development, career prep. So what that means is with that drone program is our first CDCP program at the college. So when we get apportionment full-time equivalent students from the state that we get re, uh, reimbursed, when it's, we're 99% credit at the college. So one FTES credit varied student results in about $4,300 coming to us from the state. A CDCP non-credit student results in $6,000. 
Okay, so now with the, uh, the career focus CDCP, our drone program is one of those programs that brings in a different type of revenue model to it as well. So, um, so these are the things that are being done in CTE and workforce to move that needle. You, you saw that uh, body share, the trajectory going up. I think that's going to continue going up because lots of the students are saying they need a skill. They want to go back into the workforce. And so we're going to see that probably pick up some more. There's also more programs coming, coming down the pipeline with the CDCP and talking to uh, geography. There's a potential partnership to, to have that program plus CSIS work on a GIS certificate. There's other partnerships with business and different um, departments at the college, diffuse business, uh, the, the management marketing, international business part of it to other programs on campus, which could lead to another CDCP, okay? Um, so a couple of other things, I do wanna go back. Uh, there was a mention to the li uh, regional living wage. So you saw $38,000. That is now $45,000 um, because of inflation. It went from 20 to 22. So to live, and that's one person, one child. Obviously we know it costs more. I have three children myself. I know it costs a lot more. Um, so uh, so there, there's that effort regional wide and statewide to make sure that the, the careers we're getting people prepared for accomplish and attain that regional wage. So the other thing um, related to that is all our programs, so I'm gonna switch gears to this slide here. Um, so we talked about the CTE nine units or more and how important it is to have bundled certain programs across the departments, the more we have. If we increase that by 100%, which is not a lot, that would be $2 million for, for the college, right? Um, when it comes to the regional living wage, you know, the question I often get is like, how are we gonna impact that? Like that sounds so like, it's beyond social, it's economic, political, all these factors, right, it's a system. But there's, there's a couple of ways we're doing that as a college, and that's through our ACPs, Academic and Career Pathways. One thing that we know is that our students change their, um, their majors three to seven times at a community college, sometimes more. And so that means that they're in the workforce a lot, uh, it takes them a lot longer to get to the workforce when they have a uh, focus on, on a career. Right, or a job or whatever. Um, so the ACPs try to get at the entry point uh, an opportunity to students so they can actually explore the careers, get familiar with the careers. And that is what uh, Career Coach is about. So Career Coach was, um, so I'm just gonna share a little bit about this because I know it's come up in a couple conversations. So if you look at the ACP, Explore Careers and Career Coach comes up. So the state of California purchased Career Coach um, they purchased it, purchased it five years ago. It's available to everybody. And it, when you look at the state chancellor's uh, California Community College Career Coach, it's a state chancellor California Community, Community College Career Coach, and it's branded with that. And so that takes information from our curriculum database that we submit, our catalog. The issue with that is it doesn't represent our local needs, right? So it doesn't show the zip codes. Um, that tied to Grossman College. It doesn't show the employers that serve Grossman College. It doesn't really show our uh, current programs and majors. So that's why with strong workforce support, we purchased that to have it branded with Grossman College information and have it all uh, match what we offer in terms of the curriculum and the jobs and the current employers. So that current career coach is actually a reflection of our catalog, our curriculum inventory. Um, those folks who dabble in it some, um, like the nursing, the CT programs, whenever there's a change, it's so customized to us that we can go there and change things if you see that, that there's an error. You know, so we, we did the version where you purchase it and there's a link. Um, the other version was to have our IT support it, but our IT did not have the bandwidth to support it, so that's what we currently have. So again, it's, it's uh, not any different from going to Indeed and getting looking for a job, except in this case, you do that through Career Coach, it shows all the jobs, the wages, what's available, who hires, and then you can automatically see that tied directly to our ACP and also our, our majors. So other ways we try, so again, getting students in the career path early is so important because if you have a low wage in terms of your, your current job that you're trying to accomplish after you do your, your, uh, your work at Grossmont, it takes five to seven years for you to get at parity to the wage that you're actually looking for. 
So the idea is to get an intake on onboarding that career exploration. So with career coach, you can do a six minute assessment, uh, uh, six question assessment, 30 question or 60 questions. So other things that we do is program open houses to get that awareness to our students, uh, career fairs, work with regional employers. I'm the chair for the East County Economic Development Security Workforce Committee for all of East County. So work with all employers and bring them here to Grossmont to support our students and hire our students. And I think that's all I have to, to share. So work with CTE. Thank you. All right, we are at the just about the end of our time together today. I've just got a couple, just two summary slides. So we'll go just maybe two minutes over if y'all can stay with me. Um, so our take home messages today are what are the success, what is the success portion of the student centered funding formula? And that is our transfer math and English, our degree certificate um, transfer, and the two CTE metrics. How are we doing on these metrics? Um, they're all increasing a little bit, um, especially the math and English completion rates are, are really increasing the most. How do the success funding metrics relate to our college goals? They are aligned with our college goals. So just like all of the other parts of the student-centered funding formula, if we're doing the things we value at Grossmont College, we will be improving our funding on the success metrics. And finally, what does it take to get students to these metrics? Oh my God, everything we do, everything that everybody does every day contributes to getting to those of giving up, it can be that one person that kept them on their track that one day they were having a bad day. So it really matters. Overall, what can the entire college do in order to try and keep our metrics high? Um, keep doing what we're doing basically everything we're working on to achieve equitable student success, it's gonna to contribute to increasing our revenue because it's the things that we want to be doing in the first place. And, and truly the, the way the funding formula was designed was to try and make us do the things that we should be doing. And we already know we should be doing those things and we wanna do them. So um, I don't see there being any problem with the student centered funding formula in terms of what it incentivizes us to do. So how can we specifically help out with the student success metrics in particular? One is really embrace that guided pathways paradigm. If you don't really understand what it's all about or what it means, it's important to understand the idea that we're trying to remove barriers that are keeping our students from reaching their goals. And guided pathways is it's kind of an idea. It isn't any one specific thing. So we can make it work for ourselves at Grossmont in the way that we need it to here. As we've seen from the challenges that math and English departments have had, another example is as faculty in particular, we need to keep becoming better <laughs> instructors. So learning and growing in our craft, trying to understand where our students are coming from and how to get them to the level that we um, that we uh, set as our goal for them to be prepared to excel when they transfer, how can we keep doing a better job at that? We need to support the work of counseling, curriculum, evaluations, articulation in the transfer center. If they send you an email saying, can you do this for me, please? Um, answer it, <laughs> do the thing, <laughs> um, because that may mean a student gets there gets their degree. Um, and finally, to support and collaborate with the CTE Workforce Development Division, you may not know um, all of the things that they do and the resources that they have available. And so I encourage you to um, reach out to Dean Ayala and see if there's anything in your area that you could collaborate with him. When we think about, oh, what is our college doing to do outreach and to look for things that we can leverage as far as students maybe who aren't degree seeking. Um, the CTE division is doing that, right? The CTE division is doing that. So 
Um, I want to thank all of my co-presenters today. You did a spectacular job of presenting about your work. I want to thank my co-presenters for also doing the work that they do um, and the things that they do as part of their jobs every day that help our students get to their educational goals. Thank you very much, everybody, for coming today. I appreciate your attention, and um, I look forward to continuing to do this work with you all. Thank you, Bonnie. Thank you. I, I did, but I think it was worth it. <laughs> You'll send them out, I assume, right? Yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you for um, contributing. Yeah. I really, yeah. I, I think, I think.